Herald of Truth, program number 232. The noted historian Will Durant once wrote, The greatest question of our time is not communism versus individualism, nor Europe versus America, not even the East versus the West. It is whether men can bear to live without God. More and more, modern man seems to be trying to get away from God, sometimes denying God's claims upon him, at other times even denying the very existence of God. Would anyone say that the world runs better as man rejects God? Are there fewer problems? Is man himself happier and better adjusted? It was Augustine, the great 5th century religious leader, who said, Thou madest us for thyself, and our heart is restless until it repose in thee. Yes, modern man needs God. In fact, our whole world desperately needs God. But can man really believe in God in this enlightened scientific 20th century? Well, I believe so, and for solid reasons. Back in the Middle Ages, Thomas Aquinas did a great deal of thinking and writing concerning the evidences for the existence of God. His cosmological argument is based upon the general universal observation that nothing comes from nothing. Everything must have some antecedent cause. Hence, reasoning from the world, which obviously exists, back to its creative cause, we find evidence that there must be some kind of creator. Aquinas also enunciated another argument for the existence of God, which is even more impressive to me than the cosmological argument. It's the teleological argument which refers to the beauty, the form, the purpose, and the design which is so apparent in the universe about us. When we examine the intricate, sophisticated manner in which our universe operates, we cannot but conclude that there must have been an intelligent architect, a marvelously creative mind behind it. This idea of purpose in nature and in life processes is opposed to the view of mechanism, or a mere chance origin of our universe. The force that brought the universe into being is necessarily an intelligent, planning, thinking being. Sir James Jeans, the world-renowned mathematician, has written, If the universe is a universe of thought, then its creation must have been an act of thought. Indeed, the finiteness of time and space almost compel us of themselves to picture the creation as an act of thought. Dr. Russell Mixter, a zoologist, mentions that there are probably a million species of animals on the earth. Of plants, one could find at least 200,000 species. Then he asks, order in such an array? There is order everywhere. Take just one of the one million species of animals. Each such species falls into groups, and each group can again be subdivided. But divide and subdivide as you will, the characteristics and similarities of the species will be found in all. One woodpecker, for example, has similarities that are common to all woodpeckers. Dr. John William Klotz, a geneticist, tells the story of the prison flower. Very unusual are the prison flowers, such as the common jack-in-the-pulpit. This plant has two kinds of flower clusters, male and female. These are produced inside the pulpit, which has a constriction about halfway down. Usually, pollination is effected by a tiny fly which comes in, gets past the constriction, and then finds itself trapped. Not only is the constriction in his way, but the sides of the pulpit are also waxy, preventing his getting a foothold. And so he buzzes around frantically, dusting himself with pollen in the process. Shortly thereafter, the sides of the pulpit roughen, and he's able to crawl out covered with pollen. If he visits next another male cluster, the process is repeated. But if he comes into a female flower, it's possible that he will not escape, for his frantic buzzing dusts the flower with pollen, and this time the plant is not interested in his escaping. It is to the plant's advantage to have him escape from the male pulpit to carry the pollen with him. 
The plant seems unconcerned, however, about his escape from a female flower. Then Dr. Klotz comments, after he has referred to a number of other examples, all of these instances testify to the existence of God. It is hard to believe that these could have arisen by blind chance. Their existence is due to God's directing hand and to his creative power. Dr. Cecil Boyce Heyman, a biologist, mentions the case of the remarkable Baltimore Oriole. He asks, how about the nest of the Baltimore Oriole? Who taught him that fine workmanship? Why is there such a similarity of pattern? To answer instinct is an easy way out, but it's an inadequate answer. What are instincts? Some say unlearned behavior. Is it not more logical to see God working in these creations of his according to principles concerning which we have as yet only the slightest of clues? Dr. Thomas David Parks, a research chemist, tells the interesting story of water. Water is the only known substance which becomes lighter as it freezes. The only known substance. Now, this is tremendously important to life. Because of it, ice floats instead of sinking to the bottom of lakes and rivers and gradually forming a solid mass. On top of the water, it forms a layer of insulation to maintain the water below at a temperature above freezing. Fish and other marine life are preserved, and the ice melts rapidly in the spring. Personally, I have found my explanation of these marvels, a satisfying explanation, in relating nature's order to a supreme intelligence and its design to a supreme designer. And in it all, I see more than cold, rational planning. I see the concern and love of a creator for his creatures. With examples like these before us, and there are thousands of them, how is it possible to think that our universe came by a mere chance combination of atoms? Of all of the arguments for the existence of God, None overwhelms the mind so completely as the teleological argument from design. One may not choose to worship God or even acknowledge the overwhelming evidence of his remarkable creation, but I do not see how he can do it and claim to be a respecter of evidence. In some of the instances cited, the characteristics designed could not have been achieved by a long, slow, gradual development covering eons of time. How could plants and insects which depend upon each other for survival have developed along separate lines through vast ages of evolutionary growth before discovering each other? In a sense, those who do not believe in the creative hand of God are asking us to believe that through a long evolutionary process, these remarkable phenomena developed through the various stages until ultimately the perfected stage which we now observe arrived. This is about as logical as asking us to believe that a man can jump across a wide ditch a foot at a time. He either goes all the way or he does not go at all. Until someone is able to explain all of these remarkable phenomena without a creator God behind them, we must continue to believe that there is a God who planned all of them. With the psalmist David, we say, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. God, the creator of the universe, has revealed himself to man in two important ways. First, he has revealed himself through nature, as we've emphasized in this message, then in the second place, he has revealed himself to man in his written word, the inspired scriptures. It is in the Bible that we really learn who God is and what he's like. The Bible reveals that God is an eternal being who is omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, omnipresent, present everywhere, holy, just, and merciful. We also learn in the scriptures that we are God's offspring, that we are partakers of his divine nature. We human beings are not mere animals, but have been created in the image of God in that we are eternal spirits rather than mere physical bodies. 
We have the capacity for knowing good and evil, the ability to love, the ability to worship, and many other qualities that distinguish us from the rest of creation. These blessings are very great, but they also bring heavy responsibilities. For example, we're creatures of choice and must determine our own destiny. We have the freedom to rebel against God, which all of us do, at least to some degree. We also have the freedom to love God and to worship Him. It's by this means that we fulfill our highest destiny. In loving God and in respecting His will for us, we know the greatest happiness that man can know on earth. And in this matter we achieve the peace of mind which all men seek but few ever find. The story of man is an inspiring story, but it's also a tragic story. The tragedy comes in man's rebellion against God, in man's sin. No one is without guilt, or no one is without sin. This is the theme of the whole Bible. After man had fallen into sin, rebelling against his own Creator, God continued to love him and ultimately sent his only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into the world to redeem fallen mankind. It is by God's grace that we are saved, for we have no power in and of ourselves by which to merit the forgiveness of our sins. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have eternal life. John chapter 3, verse 16. In that same chapter we read, He that believeth on the Son hath eternal life. Now notice this, But he that obeyeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. That's John 3, verse 36. In order to accept God's gift of salvation, there are simple conditions that we must meet. We must believe in Jesus Christ as the divine Son of God. We must repent of our sins, that is, turn away from our sins, genuinely regretting our sinfulness. We must confess the name of Jesus before men as our Lord and Savior. We must be buried with him in baptism, signifying death and resurrection. Then we must follow in his steps to the very best of our ability, loving God and serving our fellow men as long as we live. Without God, our world is in turmoil and strife, moving aimlessly, going nowhere. Without God, each of our individual lives is a meaningless, unhappy existence. Without God, we are always searching for happiness and satisfaction, but finding it only in fleeting moments. In contrast, with God at the center of our lives, guiding and blessing us, our lives become radiantly happy. There are goals worth living for. There are guidelines which help us to make the difficult decisions of life. There's the assurance that someone loves us and cares about us. If you do not know God personally and do not have an intimate relationship with Him through His Son, Jesus Christ, I urge you to become a Christian. Please write to me. And let me help you to know the very center of our being, the Creator God who brought us into existence and who yearns to bless us with every physical and spiritual blessing. Your letter of inquiry will receive a prompt helpful answer. So, please write to me. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you.